Mina, konbanwa, Jesus Freaking Gamer here, coming at you with 1 Chronicles chapter 6. Now, this starts off not as a genealogy, but a list of cities given to the Levites, and from there, I will launch it to the point. First, I'll read a few verses. It's going to be 1 Chronicles chapter 6, starting at verse 54. Now, these are their dwelling places throughout their settlements in their territory. Territory, yeah. Their dwelling place is referring to the Levites throughout their settlements. That second there is referring to all of Israel because they were distributed. As, if you decide to read the rest of the chapter, part of me kind of hopes you will, and especially in regards to the past message. Maybe not the very last one, but still one of the last few messages where I was like, give even the boring parts a chance. Um, throughout their settlements in their territory. Again, their territory referring to all of Israel. For they were given... This day is referring to the dwelling places themselves. They were given by lot to the sons of Aaron of the family of the Kohathites. Now, if you keep reading, the Kohathites, it wasn't just the Kohathites. It was given to all of the sons of Levi for the entire tribe of Levi and all of his descendants were given the Levitical priesthood. Or I shouldn't say the Levitical priesthood, but the Levitical duties. They helped their brethren which were the descendants of Aaron, his family specifically became the priesthood, they helped with all the duties of the tabernacle and once Solomon built it, the temple. And they had all these cities throughout all 12 tribes of Judah. Now there are two main points that I want to drive for this particular section of scripture. One is kind of a, it's a little bit more direct. The second one's not as direct. But the first one is in regards to the housing of people in ministry. Now, talking about how much money people make in ministry, it's a bit of a fishy subject. I myself plan on going into ministry myself one day in a more official capacity. Right now, I'm still in a sense a ministry. I'm preaching the word of Jesus Christ on YouTube and I'm monetizing these videos. And I, I'm getting paid for it, <laughs> not not really much of anything. Admittedly, my preaching series on YouTube is my least viewed series. At the same time, I feel like it's the most important, and I'm hoping and praying that one day people will see these videos, that they will be encouraged by these videos, they'll be strengthened by these videos, that anyone who's watching this that isn't saved will even commit their lives to Christ through these videos. I don't think they're unimportant. I don't think they're a waste of my time. And even if I don't make a lot of money on them, that's fine with me. I think I'm doing the right thing. I'm definitely preaching what I believe and being honest with you guys, doing my best to properly divide the word of truth. Uh, to use an old church saying, basically that just means properly interpreting the Bible and not, um, not uh, giving y'all any bull crap, not leading you astray or trying to twist it for my own profit or my own means. In regards to that, the Levites, and now the, the priests, they lived in the temple or the tabernacle or at least in the surrounding area. They were there at all times and they were to do the sacrifices, the, the clean, cleanliness rituals, um, inspections of things that were unclean, yada, yada, yada. Whereas the Levites, they were in charge of things like, uh, you'll, in, if you read above the section in the same chapter, 1 Chronicles 6, some of them were musicians that David appointed over the service of song in the house of the Lord. That is verse 31. And they would do other things like uh, clean up the altar after all the sacrifices. Um, assemble the tabernacle at the time when it wasn't the temple, but the tabernacle, and they had to tear it down and transport it from location to location. Um, building the tabernacle to begin with, that was a... Well, actually, all of Israel participated in that. <clears throat> Although, I, I want to say that the Levites had a particular duty, definitely in tearing it down, um, moving it to a new location. I think even in the initial building, the Levites had some specific duties. I could be wrong there. That's going to be in the last chapters of Exodus, if you're interested in that. Again, more boring stuff a lot of people may not be interested in. But as someone who wants to know the Bible, it's definitely of interest to me and to anyone out there who is interested and curious. Hopefully, I am giving good direction and good insight. And I'm helping you out a little bit. Why shouldn't people in ministry get paid, um, get remuneration, remuneration. I feel really bad. I feel like I should know what that word is. Google behind me and find out which word it should be. People, in other words, to use a much less fancy word, people should get paid to go into ministry. I don't see why so many people argue and huff and puff about how much the preacher's getting paid 
how much the church staff is getting paid, and why they should be pretty much dead broke. If God is real, and ministry is necessary, and they really are attending to spiritual needs that are real, I don't see why they shouldn't get physical remuneration, we're going to use the big fancy word, or hopefully the proper pronunciation of it again, for their services. Why shouldn't they have homes and cities and land? Uh, maybe not. The ownership of an entire city sounds kind of ridiculous right now. Of course, keep in mind that, you know, several families, like several families would inhabit a city at that time. And cities back then didn't hold hundreds of thousands of people. So I don't know how many people cities back then held, <clears throat> but it wasn't like modern day metropolises. So one city would house several families. And so back in other words, in the, to translate that into today, like a pastor's house, something along those lines. Why would that be a big deal? Why would we not want to help those who are in authority over us speaking to my fellow believers? Why would it be a big deal? Wouldn't we want them to prosper? Wouldn't we want them to get paid something above dirt poor, something above just barely making ends meet? Wouldn't we want those who are instructing us in the Word of God to be prosperous? We would want them to be not necessarily rich, but just a cut above the rest? You know, a little bit more than poor, a little bit more than just barely paying their bills. I think if, if we've entrusted them to feed us the Word of God, we want them to be decently well off, physically speaking, in their physical life. Maybe I am biased, speaking from the position of someone who wants to be in ministry, but I'm not in any official position yet. I don't get paid to do ministry, and I really don't get paid to do the ministry here on YouTube. But it's just something where I just think... Why are people so incredibly stingy when it comes to giving to the church, um, seeing what the pastor is giving? I'm not saying there shouldn't be any financial accountability. There definitely should be. But why not be generous to the pastor? Why not enable him to get a nice home with a decent amount of land, like a backyard as kids can play in, maybe even have youth events in, like a decent-sized backyard? Why not something like that? I think, as someone going into ministry, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> I think even if I wasn't going into ministry, I'd feel that way. Like, I personally, I love my pastor. I love my leaders. And you should go to a church where you love and trust your leaders. If you're in a position where you don't love and trust your leaders, get out of that church. Seriously. Don't stay there. If you think they're cheating you and they, they're not teaching the word right or something like that, please, please leave. Don't stay in a place where you're not getting where you're not getting spiritually taken care of, or worse, being spiritually abused or misled, please leave a scenario like that. Don't subject yourself or your family to that. But for those who are doing their jobs well, yeah, I, I want to see my pastor treated well. I want to see him treated right. I want, I want a, a person that I love to be taken care of. So that's just, it's something that I see in society. A lot of people is, in churches talk about how the preacher gets paid too much, and I'm like, of course, how much is too much is relative. We could talk about you know YouTube people. We could talk about professional movie stars, professional athletes. We could talk about our army and our policemen and our um, and our doctors. You know what does a, a job deserve to be paid? And that's completely subjective and relative. And even the Bible doesn't lay out an amount that pastors should earn. Although Paul does cover in Second Corinthians chapters eight and nine that someone who ministers should be able to live on their ministry. And so that sentiment, essentially, God made that a law in the Old Testament. Like, you read in Genesis through Deuteronomy, and my gosh, I am going on and on on this one. They were, they were commanded, you will have land for the Levites. You will have land for the priests. That was not optional. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in the New Testament, it's a lot more, you know, give as you feel led. There isn't necessarily a 10% tithe. And I know a lot of Christians are going to disagree with me on that. But there wasn't a, there's really no amount specified in the New Testament. And I don't think going by Old Testament laws or even the book of Malachi is correct. That was under a priest, a priesthood. It was under a temple system. It was under Israeli law. And I'm not so sure that we in the modern age, in a completely different country and different culture, or heck, even modern-day Israel should be going under an Old Testament guideline. 
Um, the priesthood doesn't exist anymore. The temple and the tabernacle don't exist anymore. And our culture is not under the Israeli law. And Jesus did change quite a few of the laws in the New Testament, which as a Christian, you know, I live under. I don't live under Old Testament laws. So I'm not so sure that there needs to be a tithe anymore. And I'm, not, and I'm not saying that there needs to be a definite amount given to people in ministry. Again, no amounts given in the New Testament. And very specific things were laid out in the Old Testament, whereas the New Testament is much more free-flowing, give as you see fit. In fact, those chapters I recommended earlier of 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 were much more attuned to give as you see fit, give as you want. So there's not a necessary amount but it does say give with a generous heart, and those who sow sparingly will reap sparingly, and those who sow bountifully will reap bountifully. So my thought is, I want my pastor taken care of. I want him to be looking out for, I love that man to pieces, and I want him to be well taken care of. I want him to be a little, maybe not necessarily like wealthy, and this is per, and this is just completely my perspective and my opinion. I think middle class would be really, really nice. Um, that would be, in a, in American terms, I don't know. It, definitely the uh, the gross per year would be lower in other countries, but in American terms, like forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, you know, something. And that's I think lower middle class. That's not even that's not even middle middle class. It sounds weird, but that's not even upper middle class. Um, that's just lower middle class. The bills are taken care of. You're probably, in, if the man is smart and if he's your preacher, hopefully he's smart. He's investing his money. You know, the, the, there's decent food on the table, healthy food on the table. Um, they're not just eating McDonald's and ramen and peanut butter and jelly. They actually have some healthy food coming their way. The bills are taken care of. You know, there there's clothing for them and the children that they have. An average household of two or three kids. So I mean, that, that, they're all subjective. All of that's completely subjective. But I think the idea of taking care of your leadership, taking care of those who are in charge of your soul, that's de that was a law in the Old Testament. And I think in New Testament times where we are allowed to do one thing or another, where we're allowed, we're allowed to give as we see fit, whatever we think is appropriate, I think it's a really good idea to make sure that our pastor is decently taken care of. And I think I want to be someone who gives generously, not sparingly, because very selfishly, I want to reap generously and bountifully, not sparingly, not cheaply, not just a little bit. And the set, so all that was just part one, how much pastors make, what, what I personally think is appropriate, the heart behind it, um, some proper interpretation. I, I believe in my, cur in my current level, where I'm currently at in my, in my Bible studies, I think that was a decent interpretation of Old and New Testament giving. And all this leads to the second point. All of this, all of this came from First Chronicles. All this came from a book. I was just meditating. I'm like, okay, what can I pull out of First Chronicles 6? What will minister to the body of God? Um, and maybe to some of the people who aren't believers along the way who might just happen upon this message. And I got all of that. I've been talking for 13 minutes now. I got all of that out of First Chronicles, chapter 6. It wasn't a genealogy. It was talking about all the cities and all the families that those Levitical, um, that those Levitical families got. But it's still technically the boring stuff. And I just put, and with a reference to the New Testament, I pulled out, I think, a decent, uh, a decent meal for the children of God, for anyone who's listening to me um, and thinks that what I say is valuable and possibly correct. I think I pulled out something halfway decent out of a boring part of the scripture. So I hope this can not only give you something to think about in regards to how much pastors make, how much they should make, what we should do with church staff, hopefully... This can also give a decent and a, and a different perspective on the boring parts of the Bible. Maybe there's something worthwhile in there. Maybe they're not so boring after all. Maybe, just maybe, they're halfway decent. Maybe, maybe it's really, really good stuff. And since I went on for quite a while, 
on this particular passage. I'm going to count this as one of the Sunday messages. Again, I'm running behind on the videos a little bit, and I do apologize for that. I am working on catching up, believe it or not. Hopefully you believe me. As someone who, as someone who tries to be honest with you guys, hopefully I have some believability and some credibility there. And if not, then... You know, just make sure you hit that th that thumbs down, that dislike button, and uh, be on your merry way and watch someone like Mark Senpai who's worthwhile watching. Anyway, I'll make this a 30-minute video since I went on for quite a ways, I'll, and it won't even be a 30-minute video. It won't be a 30-minute message, but I'll just I'll count this as a longer message because I did go on way more than five to seven minutes. And since I'm counting this as a big message, um, and maybe this will be useful to those to those people who really don't want to listen to a, a pastor or a, a self-proclaimed minister of the gospel preach for a full half hour. But if you have stuck in this long, if this has been interesting to you, I want to give anyone who doesn't believe in Jesus a chance to believe in him. All this stuff that I've set up to this point really doesn't talk about the gospel or the need for repentance. But at the same time, when, when you hear the word of God, there will be people who just happened to stumble across my YouTube channel at a particular point in their life, and they know that they need God. They're seeking, they're searching, they're wanting. And if you're one of those people who is seeking, searching, and wanting God, I want to let you know right now you can have Him. Um, His desire is for you just like your desire is for Him. He loves you. He wants you. In fact, He came to this world in the person of Jesus, and He died on the cross for you because He loves you that much. And if you want him, all you need to do is tell him right now that you want him. Just it, it, admit that you're a sinner, that you've done things that are wrong. I don't think I need to really convince anyone of that. I think we pretty much all know that we've done some wrong things. Just tell him that you've done some wrong things and that you need his forgiveness. That you believe he died on the cross for your sins, shedding his blood to wash away your sins. And three days later, he rose from the dead. And you will be saved. He will forgive you of your sins. He will hear that prayer. And if you would like a model prayer to follow after, just like maybe you can't think of your own words, then let me shoot up a model prayer for you. Pray this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I've done some bad things. And I need you to forgive me. I believe you died on the cross. And I believe you rose again. Please forgive me right now, God. And please be my Lord, my Master, and my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for being my God. And thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, don't question it or think about it for another second. You are a Christian, you are saved, your sins are forgiven, and you're on your way to heaven. Welcome to the family. It is good to have you. If I could encourage you, find a Bible. Um, if you don't own one, you're already. They're pretty cheap. They're definitely available online like pretty much everything else is. And actually, speaking of online, several editions are online for absolutely free. If you just type in like Bible on Google, you will find some free entire Bibles. Maybe not an app or a program, but you'll find them online. And if you just can't afford anything even cheap, it's there online for you to read. Read a little bit of that every single day. That way you'll get to know who God is, what his plans are for you, what his plans are for the entire world like Israel back in the day, like I was just talking about, and also what his plans are today. Like I was discussing 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, on his plans and his thoughts on giving. For today, if you want to hear God speak, if you want to know God's thoughts, reading the Bible is going to be your best bet in getting to know Him. Also, find a group of people that also believe in Jesus, that He is God, lived on this earth in the flesh, died on the cross, rose again three days later. Find a group of people. You'll probably find them at a church. Find a group of people who believe in those things as well. It's really great when you have other believers by you, and they can help strengthen your faith. They can encourage you when you're down. Churches aren't perfect, and people aren't perfect. Pastors are not perfect. They're going to make mistakes, and you're definitely going to in, 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 not inquire. You're going to incur some wounds, even at church. So don't be surprised when the people there fail you. They're humans. Um, I've failed on YouTube several times already. If you followed my channel for any length of time, you've seen that. Um, and anyone you meet in the future, they're also going to fail you.
So be prepared for that, but don't give up. Don't quit just because someone sent a snide comment, you heard someone was talking about you. Please don't quit about on that. Please don't give up on the church. And if a church hurts you deeply, um, as I was talking about earlier, if you're misled or the pre- people aren't treating you like, or the pastor's not treating you like, you know, pr- please leave and find a new church. You know, if you get hurt to a great extent and it, the problem can't be resolved, then don't give up. Find a new church. Find a new group of people who do love you, who do encourage you, who do support you. And also, honestly, who don't take your crap. Let's be honest, we're not perfect either. So if you find someone who will correct you when you've done wrong, and you know they still care about you, you found a very valuable friend. Um, that A church filled with people like that, or a majority of people like that, that would be a very good church home. It could be painful at times. It'll probably be your fault. But um, those are the, the best friends are the ones who will, who will call you on your crap. And I'll let you get away with stuff. Uh, it hurts sometimes, but really, it is, it's the best feeling in the world. Because it's like, hey, I can't get away with anything. Because my friends love me too much to let me. So find a group of Christians who believe the same thing as you, who will encourage you in that. And pray a little bit every day. Just if it's as simple as, you know, God, I love you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for the day. Or Lord, I'm hurting Today sucks, you know, my my, uh, my boyfriend, girlfriend, or my wife, my husband hasn't been treating me right, uh, you know, school sucks, or work sucks, or maybe even the big life sucks, just everything sucks right now, and I really need your help. Be sure to talk to him about it. Yeah, he already knows, but he wants to engage in that relationship with you. He wants you to talk to him. Don't. Yeah, he knows what you're thinking. Yeah, he knows what's going on. And yes, he has a solution, and he wants us to talk to him about that. He's engaged in the relationship. He wants to be with us. He knows what's going on, but he also wants us to talk to him. And we need to talk to him. We need to tell him those things. Once we pray, once we actually ask for his help, that's when we get it. We can't just assume God's going to help out and God's going to be there. While he will be there, it's when we pray that a lot of really awesome things happen. And really, the, I, the reason behind that is only because that's the way God has appointed it. That's the system that he's set up. It's not enough that he knows what's going on. He wants us to actively engage in him in the space-time we live in and tell him what's going on because that engages us in the relationship with him because we don't know the future. We don't know what's happening, so we should talk to him. And then he will begin ministering to us, telling us what we need to do, giving us guidance and direction where we need to go. Don't just assume it's going to happen since you're a Christian. Make sure you talk to your Heavenly Father about the things that are going on in your life. He does love you tremendously, and he wants you to talk to him. So, God, in up to 22 minutes, that ended up being a full message, all from First Chronicles, a boring part of the Bible. Thank you guys so much for watching this. If you stuck all the way through to the end, I appreciate it so, so much. And I love each and every one of you, even those of you who aren't Christians, even those of you who stuck through this and you're like, I really don't believe in this whole Jesus thing. I still love you to pieces. So does God. And God bless each and every one of you.